Hosanna in the highest. This day is Palm Sunday, a day that we celebrate with all the teeming throngs in Jerusalem. Uh, that day when Jesus made his grand entrance into the holy city of David. And this morning we're going to begin with a little clip that illustrates that. And then we're going to start with a rather, uh, may I say, rousing song regarding the Hosannas. And so be ready to sing. Uh, and then Bob will come and open us in prayer and with our first hymn. But let's enjoy as we contemplate and consider the celebratory nature of this Sunday in particular, leading up to the cross and Easter resurrection morning. <laughs> Watching online today, uh, you're not going to have to worry about driving home in the rain. Uh, but for those of you that are present, I'm afraid the deluge is going to catch you. And hopefully, the thunder and the lightning will hold off before until 12 noon. Then it can just open up. That'll be fine. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for each one who've come to be a part of our service today. And Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity we have together as a body of believers to meet with you to lift up the praises of your Son, to lean into the Holy Spirit and to ask for Him to enlighten us today, to give us understanding of what we're going to look at in this living volume that you've given to us, your love letter. Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for the blessing of being able to worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you for being the living God. Thank you for sending your son, the Lord Jesus, so that we could have this relationship with you. That it's not vain for us to be here today. That it's meaningful. That it can be life-changing. And I just pray now that we would be open to what you have for each one of us. I ask for your enablement as I share this message. There may be something that you want said in this service that wasn't covered in the early and vice versa. So, Lord, I just pray for your directing of my words today. We'll give you the praise for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. There was a day not too long ago when the biggest health concern for most folk was getting the flu shot. Now, in the age of COVID, it's shifted to landing a vaccine appointment. Or, if you're leery, avoiding it altogether. I'm not going there. 
I kind of liken it to a love-hate relationship. Similar to making dental appointments. Scheduling one is the right decision. It's always the right decision, but I dread the drill. Am I alone? Does anybody really enjoy when the dentist says we have to drill? I don't think anyone does. For some, the thought is so troubling, they simply refuse to book a date, even as their teeth suffer. They'd rather not go there. Appointments can be daunting based on their context. Phrases can be as well, such as, it's time, or it's time. Two little words, but they pack a punch. For instance, if you're standing at the back of the church next to a beaming and beautifully dressed bride, the words, it's time, fill her with unspeakable joy. She's been waiting for this day. She's been gearing up for this day. We have a son newly engaged. And now they're planning the what? The wedding. A lot of fun planning the wedding. But they're looking forward to that day. It's going to create unspeakable joy. It's time those two words bring that. But if you're a convicted murderer, sitting on death row with no reprieve in sight, it's time elicits another kind of emotion. Same phrase, different settings. This morning, as we revisit the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem on what is referred to as Palm Sunday, we're going to see Him fulfilling a heavenly appointment. God speaking, if you can picture it, this appointment ordained by God, and Him saying, Son, it's time. Words that would lead to intense suffering and this humiliating death on the cross at Golgotha. Paul captures the depth of this sacrifice in Philippians chapter 2 with a summation of the great kenosis or the self-emptying of Christ. First, in temporarily setting aside the outward manifestation of His divine nature or what He was in glory, God's Son exchanged that expression for the form of a servant coming in the likeness of men. And then second, as a man, he humbled himself. He stooped very low and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. That's a horrific way to die, by the way. So, so take a step back and just think about this. Jesus, in eternity past, has shared the glories of heaven with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Distinct and yet equal in the recognition of who they were that they were divine, that they were deserving of all the accolades and the wonders and the splendor of heaven. And now yet he's laid that aside and come to planet earth. And beyond even that, taking on the likeness of human flesh, veiling that pre-incarnate glory behind that flesh, he stooped even lower in going to this cross to die for who? The likes of us. Incredible abasement of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is aptly illustrated in Proverbs 15, where the author writes, before honor is humility. Honor's here, humility is here. The same principle Paul highlights in Philippians. Therefore, in light of Jesus' humility, an ultimate obedience unto death at the cross, God has highly exalted Him and bestowed on Him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Before honor is humility. A reality that was clearly evident in Jerusalem as Jesus approached during the feast of the Passover. All four Gospels record this triumphal entry of the Christ. But we're going to focus on Matthew's account this morning. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to Matthew's Gospel and chapter 16 where we're going to begin. 
And if you don't have a Bible with you, you'd like to follow along, take the burgundy-covered pew Bible and turn to page number 866. I finally remembered to say it. The Bibles are back. I can do that again. You can use the pew Bible. Keep in mind as you go there that Jesus is about to enter his final week of public ministry. It's been three years since his baptism and commission. John the Baptist heralded the startup of his ministry with this stunning announcement. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Since that moment, Jesus has been performing the miraculous. He's been teaching like no one else. And many, including his half-brothers, wanted to force his hand. They wanted to make him their king. Demands he wasn't ready to commit to. So what did he do? He departed again to a mountain by himself alone. Occasionally he would say, my time has not yet come. Meaning, he was marching to the drumbeat of his heavenly Father, rather than the desires of earthly men. However, as the months passed, and his appointment at Calvary drew near, Jesus began to prepare his men for his departure. Look at Matthew 16 and verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go To Jerusalem. From what time? Well, here in context, from the moment of Peter's confession by the Spirit that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the anointed Messiah. You are one in nature with God Himself. You're the God-man. From that time, Jesus says, listen, I've got to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, the religious leaders, and be killed and be raised again the what? Third day. Now, does that sound pretty clear? Is Jesus making it foggy or misty here? No, He's shooting straight. Guys, this is what's going to occur. Before honor is humility. A point Peter contested by confronting Jesus, verse 22. Then Peter took him aside. Imagine taking your Creator aside to give Him the what for. Who does Peter think he is? Oh, wait a minute. Peter doesn't think. So he just drives in. He takes him aside and he begins to rebuke him. Admonish him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, because he knew the real source behind what Peter was now saying, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Luke's account... Oh, excuse me. Jump ahead to Matthew 20. Let's go there first. Matthew 20 and verse 17. Then Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. Why? Because it's time. And the third day he will rise again. Luke's account adds an extra reference. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. And one particular prophecy unfolds right before our eyes in the manner in which Jesus chooses to approach the holy city, the ancient city. Look at chapter 21 and verse 1 of Matthew's Gospel. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage or Bethphage, 
the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. Now you can see the wheels in their heads turning. You mean, Lord, you just want us to go and take this guy's livestock? Isn't that going to create an issue? Isn't that kind of like stealing? Well, Jesus has got a code phrase for them that's going to give them a pass. Look at verse 3. And if anyone says anything to you, and that might even include the owner, just say, the Lord has need of them. And immediately, he will send them. So that was the code phrase. The Lord has need of them. I don't suggest you use that today for something else. This worked then, okay? Verse 4. All this was done that it might be what? Fulfilled. Which was spoken by who? The prophet. And in this particular case, Zechariah, 500 plus years earlier. 500 years before the event. Saying, verse 5, Tell the daughter of Zion, referring to Jerusalem, the holy city and its residents, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, a symbol of peace, the foal or son of a donkey. What a strange mode of transportation to Western eyes. But not to Easterners. Since donkeys were the royal animal of Jewish monarchs, often ridden in times of peace. Very normal sight to the Eastern mind. How fitting then that the Prince of Peace, according to Isaiah 9 and Daniel 9, would enter Jerusalem, the city of peace, on the foal of a donkey, a symbol of peace, as the King of Peace. What a perfect picture of what God is wanting to accomplish. How appropriate for the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world to begin with His own people. I'm going to start with my own. But according to the biblical record, the Hebrew nation rejected their Messiah and chose instead to crucify Him with the help of the Gentiles the Roman rulers, they hated. And I think this explains why Matthew leaves out certain portions of Zechariah's prophecy as he quotes it in verse 5. All that Zechariah says back in Zechariah isn't here in verse 5. Here's the entirety of that particular verse. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout how! Aloud! O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So right off the bat, if you compare that to what Matthew says here, you realize he's left off rejoicing and shouting. Why admit, omit those two? Because their rejoicing was premature. Their rejoicing would pass. They were expecting Jesus to pull the plug on Roman oppression. But that wasn't His primary mission. Not on this during this Advent. Also, righteous and having salvation, that's missing from Matthew's quote. Well, the Scriptures are pretty clear. Salvation, deliverance from sin's penalty is provided in only one way. Through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That's the only way it's made possible. But Israel rejected that message. Jesus came to His own, John records, and His own did not receive Him. You are not the Messiah we're looking for. See you later. Here's the awful reality for any nation or individual who refuses Jesus' offer of salvation. A day of judgment awaits. A day of judgment awaits. Christ is going to return as a conquering king, not on a donkey. Not on a donkey. On something else. Would you like to know what? Some of you already do. I wish I had a picture right now to put up. Then I 
saw heaven opened, John exclaims in Revelation 19. And behold, a white what? Horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire. And on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe, dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So mark it down. As Jesus approached the holy city in Matthew's account, He did so as the Lamb of God, lowly and riding on a donkey. But when He returns in all of His splendor, according to John's revelation, He'll do so as what? The line of the tribe of Judah. Before honor, King of kings, Lord of lords, is humility. King of peace, lowly and riding on a donkey. Look at verse 6. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. Is that a good idea? When Jesus gives us a command, should we do the same thing? Just do what I ask? That's a good idea. They brought the donkey and the colt. They laid their clothes on them, and He sat on them the clothes. In John's narrative, he acknowledges that much of what unfolds here is lost on Jesus' disciples. They don't quite get it yet. Listen to John's own admission. His disciples did not understand. They didn't mentally grasp these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then the light came on. They remembered that these things were written about Him by the prophets and that they had literally done these things to Him. May I say it again? Before honor is what? I've said it enough times, you should know the answer. Humility. Humility. Sadly, like Peter before them, the Passover crowds wanted to sidestep Jesus' humiliation. They wanted to fast track to the kingdom. Let's get there where we're in charge and the Romans are out. And that explains kind of his royal welcome in verse 8. And a very great multitude spread their garments on the road. They estimate that around 2 million Jews were gathered for the Passover. This place is packed with people. They spread their garments on the road. Others cut down branches, palm branches from the trees, which were symbols of peace and victory. They spread those on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Save now, O save us. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Before a bride walks down the center aisle of a church, usually flower girls go uh, ahead and they sprinkle rose petals uh, kind of in a way to honor the event, to honor the occasion. If you're the President of the United States of America landing in another country, they'll usually roll out the what? The red carpet. Uh, you're a VIP. You know, if I show up in a foreign country, I don't get that. It's just your commercial, get off like everybody else does. But if you're President, it's different. But if, like Jesus, you're being welcomed into Jerusalem as the great deliverer, the one who's finally going to free us, Hosanna to the Son of David, save us, we pray, then your red carpet treatment will be these palm branches and the cloaks. It was a festive procession. It was a loud procession. And Jesus doesn't stop it. He doesn't say, hey, look, just bring it down a notch. Cool it. Relax. He doesn't do that. Even as the shadow of the cross looms in the distance, Look at verse 10. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, 
shaken, stirred, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. How much of the city was shaken? All of it. But not before Jesus was moved. Turn, if you would, over to Luke's Gospel in chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. And as you turn there, I'm going to put up a map of Jesus' pathway to the city. He's coming through Bethany and Bethphage, and he crests the Mount of Olives. It dips down into the Kidron Valley and comes back up to Jerusalem. But as he crests the Mount of Olives, the, the city comes into full view. It's, it's all there in its splendor. Luke 19 and verse 41. Now, as he drew near, he saw in full view the city. And what did he do? He wept over it. The Greek word is with loud and deep lamentation. Commenting on this scene, Ken Geyer writes the following. He is so near Jerusalem, yet Jerusalem is so far from Him. And the pain of that thought is almost too much for Him to bear. He sees the city. He weeps over it, saying, verse 42, If you had known, even you especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace... But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you. They will surround you and close you in on every side. There will be no way of escape. And they will level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. How long he cried, or how hard, we are not told, Geyer notes. But the word Luke uses is a strong one, used of convulsive sobbing. All of us, I think, have been on this planet long enough, probably save one, who knows what this kind of sobbing feels like. When you're almost out of control and your, your whole body is just doing this. This is the kind of crying Jesus is doing over Jerusalem. Talk about contrasts. As Jesus approaches the holy city, the teeming throngs begin to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice, two million strong, while He weeps uncontrollably. Which is it? What's the source behind His lament? What dark thoughts billow within Jesus to produce this downpour of emotion? What chilling sight causes his feelings to condense into tears? Who knows for sure? But who can blame him? He is going to his death. A horrible, shameful, humiliating death. He knows the pain will be unbearable. He knows the cloaks of honor will lead to a cloak of dishonor. He knows the blessings outside the gates will change to curses within. He, know the hand, he knows the hands of praise will become fists of punishment. He knows the reverently placed palms will become a mocking reed scepter. But knowing all this, Jesus does not weep for Himself. He weeps for Jerusalem. Through a mist of remorse, Jesus peers into Jerusalem's future. He sees legions of soldiers surrounding the city. Their swords are drawn and their battering rams positioned. Their catapults cocked and ready to heave boulders at the walls. 
He sees the bloodshed. He hears the tortured cries. He feels the pain of manacles cutting the wrists of survivors. According to Josephus, Titus, the general besieged Jerusalem in A.D. 70 when it was full of Passover visitors. Roman troops surrounded the city. They kept anyone from entering or leaving and cut off from supplies. Many of the Jews resorted to eating the leather on their belts and sandals. Many starved. By August, soldiers stormed the city and tore down the temple. Those who escaped the sword, they fled to higher ground. But by September, they too were defeated and the city destroyed. Over a million Jews died. Those who survived were enslaved. How much future did Jesus see that day? as he sat on the low back of that little donkey that clopped along the downhill road to Jerusalem? Just 40 years? Or did he see further? The Savior's tears are mentioned sparingly in the Scriptures, and then only in passing. He wept over a friend who died, and over a nation that in its own way had also died. He called them both out of their tombs. Lazarus came forth. Jerusalem didn't. In Hebrews chapter 9, we read that it is appointed for men to die how many times? Once. And after this, the judgment. Sobering words confirming the reality of an earthly appointment that refuses to be canceled. A whole lot of folk getting canceled today. You cannot cancel death. I'm sorry. We like to put it off. I'd kind of like to show up late for that one. But death won't be rescheduled. Not for any of us. When it's time, it's time. So I think there's real benefit in contemplating, thinking about whether or not we're ready for keeping that appointment. Rather than ignoring it to our own peril. Oh, I'll just put it off. I won't worry about that till I cross that bridge. And it might be too late. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, made this observation. Our people die well. So that's morbid. No, it's not. That's a tribute to God's grace. And the saving merit of that grace in a life. And how to live a life well. But what terror awaits those who fail to make their peace with God in this life? It's illustrated vividly in the life of Hugo Chavez, the Venezuelan president from days past. These are his last words. Please don't let me die. I don't want to die. But he did. As we all will if the Lord tarries someday. Now, could he have exited this world without fear? Certainly, because Jesus went to the cross. He died in our place so we could be cleansed from our sin and adopted into God's wonderful forever family. The author of Hebrews is clear on this because God's children are human beings. We're made of flesh and blood. The Son, Jesus Christ, also became what? Flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. And only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. You see, for the believer, as the end nears, the words, it's time, are filled with hope and anticipation. I'm about to get out of here and graduate. I can hardly wait. But for those who haven't trusted in Christ, for the forgiveness of their sins, death's appointment produces something altogether different. I don't want to die. Please don't let me die. I'm glad there's a remedy provided by God through the shed blood of His Son, the Lord Jesus. 
All we have to do is humbly say yes to the King of Peace in this life before the next one begins. If you wait till then, it's too late. It's got to be in this life. Let's stand together and we'll close in prayer. Father, thank you for sending the perfect sacrifice for an imperfect people so that we today could stand here in hope knowing that when we draw our last breath, we'll be with you in paradise. We'll be with your son. We'll be with the spirit. We'll be with our loved ones that have gone ahead. God, help us in the week ahead to remember that before honor is humility. That there's great blessing that comes out of that. Help us to walk humbly with you, to love mercy and to act justly so that we might be the kind of witness you've called us to be before others as we encounter them. And Father, help us not to forget that this life is not forever. There's another one on the way. And because of what you accomplished, Jesus, we can look forward to that life with confidence. And it's going to be for eternity. It's not going to be we get there and a month later you say, okay, that's it, we're done, shut the doors. No, it's for eternity. And we're not going to be bored. We're not going to be floating about playing harps. No, we're going to be active. It's going to be a tremendous time. So God, help us not to keep this message to ourselves. Help us to share it freely with others so they too can become a part of your forever family. We'll praise you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless and happy Palm Sunday.